Satanism. To some, it's a religion as valid as Christianity. To others, it is a dangerous and subversive cult. Whatever the truth is, there are thousands of devotees of Satan, and it's becoming more and more popular thanks to the internet. But what really goes on beneath the robes, amid the candles? Is there a darker side to the sacrifices and the rituals? Satanism refers to the real or mythical figure known as Satan, whose followers look at him as an inspiring, just, and even heroic figure. These people that genuinely believe in, in, in Satan and all of his dark darkness, they believe in it far more probably than the, the pure white light of Christianity. What if there is a ladder beyond us which consists of beings of pure energy? And what if some of them are morally good and some morally evil? Today, it's estimated that there are as many as 100,000 Satanists in the world, all worshipping the devil, with the goat of Mendes becoming one of its most common symbols. It's a worldwide phenomenon, and it's growing every year. Satanism is becoming more popular, and I think one of the reasons is probably the de decline of, of the, the Orthodox Church, of, of Christianity. Um, they've kept us under a very tight reign for the best part of 2,000 years, and yet all of us deep down want to be sinful and, and do naughty things, and of course that's what Satanism is all about. Sex, debauchery and anything else that you want to do, Satanism allows you to do it. Hallelujah. Praise the new Lord, Satan. Satanism is pretty much at its pinnacle of popularity. It's estimated there's over 100,000 members of the Church of Satan, and it's really become quite trendy. We see a lot of TV shows geared towards the whole concept of, you know, very dark, satanic, uh, witchcraft-oriented sort of TV. And we see how a whole counterculture of teenagers who are becoming more interested in this and growing popularity than because of it. There are certain extremely dubious black magicians who perform all kinds of unholy ceremonies in the name of Satan, and for them, by responding to him as the personification of evil, they can justify their own evil acts, their greed, their unrestricted sexuality, and the other strange things that they do, the blood sacrifices and so forth. I haven't come forth in a great many years, but I can assure you, Satanism is here to stay. Perhaps the most widely known aspect of Satanism is the Church of Satan itself which was founded by a man called Anton LaVey in America in 1966. Today, it has thousands of members across the world and has its headquarters in the appropriately named Hell's Kitchen area of New York City. Where else? Gavin Baddeley is the church's representative in the UK and he's agreed to meet me and tell me all about it. I'd imagined uh, that there would be more kind of uh... Uh, ritual sacrifices and pentagrams and candles and capes and that kind of thing. Oh, we certainly have our pentagrams and candles and capes. But yeah, that image exists and we play up to it. And a lot of people who are drawn to Satanism are drawn because they, uh, the, the, the sort of sex and blood uh, iconography is, is very appealing. And uh, certainly there are members of the Church of Satan who indulge in various uh, rituals. But at core, um, I think far more significant is the way in which people think. And it's very easy as somebody who 
uh, um, occasionally operates as a spokesman for Satanism, to be drawn into uh, fulfilling other people's expectations. They want the, the, the blood and the, the candles and the goats and everything, and that's there. But that's not what Satanism is. But do you have ceremonies and, and, and rituals? They take place, certainly. I've fielded a lot of telephone calls from journalists over the years who say, you know, uh, I want you to take me to a, 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 a naughty naked ritual, you know, and I'll bring my credit card, and it's kind of like, find your own naughty naked ritual. Uh, if we do these things, they're for ourselves, they're a form of theatre, they're a way of energising, they're fun. The Church of Satan is, is a very corporate American thing. It's very big in the States. It's so big, in fact, now that you can actually dial 1-800 number and you'll get a call, hi, Church of Satan, how may I direct your call? And, and the, the Americans absolutely love it. It's a cult and they love cults. It is spreading. It's spreading to Europe and it's spreading to England as well. You have to imagine there's a lot of people who feel that the standards that God has set out are just too high and, and really quite unfair and, and, and not really something that they're, they're up for adhering to. So this notion of the devil being kind of, you know, accepting of who you are and just a little bit naughty has a certain appeal to people. The Church of Satan wasn't so much a pro-Satan, pro-evil. It was more of an anti-church establishment. Uh, certainly from where it came out of the 50s and 60s, you had very much a Christian American ideal, uh, which for a lot of people was not what they wanted. So it was a very good way of breaking away and saying, I don't want that, I want this. I want the sex, I want the drugs, I want the alcohol, I want the music, and I want to have fun. And a lot of it stemmed from having fun. Uh, they, they one of the things that Anton LaVey said was his difference between him and the Christian church was that the Christians believe that if someone strikes you on the cheek, you forgive. He believed if someone strikes you on the cheek, you punch them in the face. Apart from that, it's a beautiful religion. The worship of Satan is a practice as old as our civilization. But since the rise and dominance of Christianity in the Western world, it's gone underground. In the 18th century, it became very fashionable for the aristocracy to hold secret meetings in the dark, undisturbed corners of their estates, where these satanic rituals were said to have taken place. Now, one of these groups was the infamous Hellfire Club, and they held their meetings here in these West Wickham caves. The Hellfire Club had a reputation for wickedness and debauchery on a legendary scale. It was said that there were decadent parties, orgies, and satanic worship going on deep underground. Local guide Jack Orr agreed to take me down into the labyrinth and show me around. So we are a set of tunnels that were done in 1748. And the beautiful thing about us is we are 100% man-made. OK. And the whole way down, it goes 300 feet underground, quarter of a mile. And at the very bottom is the inner temple, which is the man-made hell of this place. The man who commissioned this place, Lord Dashwood, was the head of the debaucherous, notorious Hellfire Club, a secret society dedicated to, well, as we believe, mocking religion. So this is where the Hellfire Club would have met down in here. Mm -hmm. They used to meet originally at Medenham Abbey, which is a couple of miles away from here, but it was too public. They had the newspapers following them, and so they went, oh, we need to go somewhere else. Where better than underground? About halfway down through the caves is a large cavern cut out of the limestone where all manner of debauchery was said to have taken place. So this chamber coming up, this is the one I truly want you to see. This is the pinnacle point, the absolute hive. This is what they called the banqueting hall. Right. Step on inside. Oh, wow, look at that. That's extraordinary. <laughs> so what would have gone on in here? 
In here, this was where they really released all their, their inner Bacchus, as it is. This is where they succumbed to the flesh. This was where they became even more intoxicated. So as I said, they were dressed in costume, but this is where the costume would start to fall off. <laughs> okay. This is where they would start truly indulging themselves in several different manners. So they would begin feasting in here and they would begin drinking even more, consuming more and more. And in these chambers behind us, these four alcoves, there weren't bars, there were curtains across here, and there were beds inside. Right. So as they were all gorging themselves here with gluttony and whatnot, they would retire there for the more lustful acts. And as you can tell, because of how this chamber is built, the sounds, of all the singing, of all the grunting, all of it would have just filled this chamber and would have carried up the passageways. This would have come to life and reverberated with just sin, I suppose is the best way. The Hellfire Club was actually nothing more than a, a, a group of, of toffs, um, upper class people, uh, and the whole idea of it was sex and drugs and rock and roll. Um, and like so many things that, that people don't know about, including Masons and all sorts of other things, anything that we don't know, because it was always held in secret, and the reason it was held in secret was basically because they were doing things that their wives probably wouldn't have been very keen to, to know about. Um, and so people make up stories. And so it was all to do with demonology and Satanism and, and the black arts and black magic and all these dreadful things that they were doing. Were they? Yeah, a little bit. They were probably testing the water a little bit, but on the whole, I think it was a jolly good drinking club where a few girls were brought in, everyone got drunk and things got rather out of hand. Nothing more than that. The Hellfire Club was an exclusive sort of society for highbrow, Britain in the 18th century, but it was really twisted. You're now several hundred feet under the earth. Anything can go on there. Nobody's gonna know. This is why you're there. You're outside of London. No one even knows you're there. And what goes on in the Hellfire Caves stays in the Hellfire Caves. And you could only imagine that they were completely unaccountable. Nobody had to apologize for anything. You walk into those caves, all bets are off. You can let all your inhibitions free and behave just the way all your fantasies would tell you you'd want to behave. That was the real Fifty Shades of Grey. So how did one become a member of the Hellfire Club? Well, it was a secret society. So it was purely on invitation um, and sort of election. A, a man of the club could put your name forward as a possible member based on your character. There were 13 apostles. There was a sort of hierarchy, and the 13 apostles were in charge of the more secretive side of the club. They, led by the abbot, who was often Sir Dashwood himself, they did all their dark business down here. So now we're about to go to the very bottom. We are reaching our final destination as such. Okay. And we're about to cross over the River Styx. And I'm sure you know the legend that once you cross over the River Styx... That's it. No coming back. So what, there's actually a river down here? It is. It's a man-made river and they would have taken a boat from where you're standing now to their final point. This is it? This is indeed the river of the dead and the damned. And round the corner is a cursing well where they used to baptise new members into the club. Right, so there wasn't a boatman here, though? There would have been a gondola from this side to the other to ferry them across. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> So what would have happened in here? Well, this is where the 13 apostles and the abbot would have met. This is the secret part of the secret society. 
And in here we have statues depicting all of the members for their meeting. And at the very back, we have the statue of Venus overwatching everything that they're doing. And there's all sorts of rumours as to what exactly happened in here. Going from, oh, it was just lads having a good time, drinking a bit much, to ladies used to come down here and lose all of their virtues to these men. And what about any kind of evidence of satanic worship, uh, rituals? Sir Francis Dashwood has had a whole library of occult and black magic books. He really leaned towards it. He found it fascinating. So it is possible that he indoctrinated a lot of these ancient rites among all of the lords and ladies in here. And you would be absolutely amazed what a lord in the 18th century could get away with if he wanted to. It really is a strange feeling being down here in the caves, truly oppressive and quite forbidding. A rich man's satanic fantasy carved out of limestone hundreds of feet underground. These guys that are sacrificing goats, um, screaming goats, cutting off the heads of chickens, drinking blood, um, and, and basically doing everything that's anti-Christ, anti for want of a better word, do they believe that they're actually getting something out of it? Or is it a load of absolute crap? They definitely could have gotten up to anything they wanted to in those caves. I mean, who is going to check up on them? We don't have the modern day press hounding them like we have today, watching and stalking their every move. So it was a very elite group of people, very secretive. And if one ratted on another one, well, then there goes their, their community. You would think that they would want to keep this secret. How, who's going to find out? So they could get up to anything that they wanted to without anyone monitoring them. On the surface, it was really a gentleman's drinking club. But by all accounts, it got very pagan. And in fact, it was an excuse for the high class ladies of society to really kind of act out their sexual fantasies, because that's what it was. It was more of a pagan sex club than it was anything else. The current Lord Dashwood agreed to meet me in the grounds of his family's estate and discuss the goings on of his former ancestors. Sir Edward, what would have gone on up there? We, we don't know exactly what went on in direct answer to your question, but we have a good idea. Some people imagine the worst, and you have all sorts of stories that, that come out, um, particularly in the Victorian times, of what they got up to. Um, we know they had a lot of fun. That's the main thing. Was there any sort of satanic rituals going on down there? Um, I like to think not, and we have no evidence of it, although he was clearly interested in all sorts of um, peripheral things on the side of that. So we have Masonic symbols in one of the, the rooms in the house here, um, and we have a river Styx at the bottom of, a, of the case itself, and, and the inner temple, and the river Styx, you know, your, your mythology, it separated the real world from the underworld, and it was where care on a boatman uh, led you across. So, so the fact that he even built the river Styx, you know, he was interested in, in, in the afterlife and, and all of that, there, there's no doubt. There's stories about a, a woman who was uh, said to have been turned into a nymphomaniac. Tell me a bit more about that. Yes, that was great fun. That was fantastic. So, so in, I think it was in the middle of the 80s, I, I recall it reasonably well, and, and a uh, coach party of, 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 of old dears went down the caves, and one of them came out and said she'd been a spinster all her life, had no sexual experience whatsoever, and she was assaulted by the evil influence of my ancestor, and that the Satan was at work, and um, he was alive and well in the caves, and it, therefore it should be closed down immediately because this influence had turned her into a raving nymphomaniac. Um, and the local, not just the local papers, actually, I think the News of the World or The Sun or one of those newspapers got a hold of it, and it was on the front page, you know, clays must be closed down due to evil influence of Sir Francis Dashwood. Um, and the only result was we, we doubled the number of visitors who came to the caves, who were all obviously looking, at, looking for the same experience. And there was a priest 
who visited the caves, who, who felt that there might have been some kind of evil influence down there. Tell me a bit more about him. Well, it, it's quite interesting. We do get people from time to time who do feel, now whether it's their imagination or, or there's some reality behind it, they, they definitely go down there and they feel something strange or they're not happy with, with the atmosphere or, or, or the, the influence the caves have on them. It could be their imagination, it could be true. But, but yes, no, you're absolutely right. From time to time, people, uh, they, they come back feeling very strange from, from having visited the caves. One of the most popular and disturbing manifestations of Satan and evil itself is a possession, a human body that has been taken over by a demonic entity or even the devil himself. Chris Thompson is a practicing exorcist. He says he carries out dozens of exorcisms every year and that he's becoming increasingly busy. He's allowed us to film a recreation of a typical exorcism. you've got to do is find out if it is genuinely something that's possessing them or whether it's in the mind. I mean, obviously, people can get terrified by what's going on. So first of all, you uh, establish if it's genuine and then find out who it is and get them to move out using whatever methods necessary. Various things I use. I do have holy water. I can also use smudging, which is burning white sage. I've also got smokeless methods as well that I can use. What is the point of an exorcism? What are you trying to achieve? The idea is to get whatever's moved into the host out of there. What are you saying has moved in? It could be a demon or just another spirit that's moved in there to somehow try to re interact with the person. And are they real or are they just imaginary on the um, part of the person you're exercising? To the person that I'm exercising, they are very real. But who knows? Does the spirit actually just affect the mind or does it affect the whole body? Do you believe that there are demons, there are spirits that go around possessing people? I do believe that there are things that we don't know about, the definite. I've recorded them on many occasions. I've experienced them for myself. Yes, I'm a medium, but I'm also very skeptical. And I'm trying to find out what it is. I don't know whether what I'm talking to is the spirit of another person, or for all I know, it could be little men from Mars that's somehow communicating with us. And I need to find the answer. To exorcise someone, you have to believe that they are possessed by a demon, by something evil. Um, it, it, it basically comes, again, from Christianity, of course, and, and the fact that there's good, so there has to be evil. And so anyone that, that happens to be hearing voices or anything like that, it, it's a demon that's either whispering in their ears or a demon that has possessed them. And the only way to get that demon out is by bringing in um, a priest, uh, splashing holy water on you, um, screaming, be gone, evil demon, getting them to, to recite various oaths and things. Um, there's no such thing as demons, trust me. According to the Catholic world, to conduct an exorcism, you have to be an ordained priest. But in, as, as regards Christianity as a whole is concerned, any good Christian
can conduct an exorcism, a successful exorcism. I personally have, in the past, conducted exorcisms. I can't tell you whether they've worked or not, because I'm not sure how much I actually believe that anyone is possessed with an evil demon. In an exorcism, there's the sorts of things that you would expect, and you've been seen in films for, for a long time. So the primary objective is to find out the demon's name. If you can find out the demon, demon's name, you can expel them. But while you're trying to do that, you have the, the person who's, who's suffering, who's possessed. They're speaking in tongues. They're vomiting. They're using vulgar language. They're, they're behaving in a way that looks like as though they're mentally ill. They're both buying into the fact that there's a demon involved here, and thus they're both taking on roles that may just be that, not real sort of possession, but physiological sort of association with what they think they should be saying and doing and behaving. Exorcisms can get extremely wild and, and rather volatile, to say the least. Um, projectile vomiting, spitting, um, young girls that are literally um, timid, um, actually with, with, with male voices, um, scratching and, and literally, literally having to be held down by, by men uh, to stop them from, from attacking the person that's, that's actually conducting the exorcism. Um, whether it is a demon inside them or whether it's just, whether they're just playing bonkers, I don't know. I'm not gonna deny the existence of a spirit world, but what I do deny is the authenticity of most of these exorcists. I think they're putting on a show. I think it's sort of a placebo. They're behaving in a way they've seen on television or they feel they need to behave in order to get a reaction a placebo reaction from the possessed. It's really a show. Nine out of 10 times, I don't think it's very authentic at all. When you're doing an exorcism, and I haven't done many, uh, but, but yes, I think you can actually tell if, if there is something genuinely in, when I say in that person, uh, demon, I don't know about, but I, I think you know whether they are genuine or whether they're actually acting it out and putting it on, whether they've put themselves into a trance before it or, or it's just purely an act. Yeah, you can tell. On some occasions, I think that we are dealing with a mental problem, a psychosis of some kind, and if the person with that psychosis has a deep religious conviction that evil spirits exist and that one has got into him, and a priest then performs an exorcism, if he believes both in the power of exorcism and in the evil spirit as part of his psychotic imaginings, he will then feel better. So an exorcism can heal psychosis as well as driving out some sort of tangible psychic entity. The famous Satanist was Alistair Crowley, an English occultist from the early 20th century. Now, he set up the religion and philosophy known as Telema, in which he was the prophet entrusted with guiding his followers. He gained widespread notoriety for his use of religious sacrifices and sex magic, and was denounced by the press as the wickedest man in the world. Alistair Crowley, was a strange man. He wasn't a Satanist. Um, he wasn't a, a witch, but he was he was wicked. He was evil. Um, and at the age of 11, he actually murdered the family cat. And the reason he did it was because he wanted to test whether a cat really had nine lives. So he bashed it on the head. He strangled it. He poked its eyes out. He, he tried to drown it. He, and he set fire to it. And this was all, as he said, in the name of science. He was 
a strange gentleman. He was into sex and drugs and rock and roll, debauchery. He was bisexual and he was into the occult big time. Aleister Crowley might be the most famous occultist, author, and most importantly, ritual practitioner of magic that's ever been. Some historians claim that Crowley was recruited into British intelligence and that he remained a spy throughout his life, although this was never proved. As his actions became more and more extreme, in 1920, he was told to leave Britain or face arrest. So he established a satanic commune in Sicily, where he lived with his followers practicing ritual sacrifice, sex magic, and other depraved acts. Aaron Paramore is an occult researcher who has studied Crowley in detail. He thinks he really was as wicked as he was portrayed. So, so what was Crowley getting up to? Well, he kind of earned his name, the wickedest man in the world, um, because he was a notorious bisexual. He took, um, he enjoyed men as well as lots, lots of women. He, uh, he was a mountaineer. He was the enfant terrible. He was a, he took a lots of drugs. Uh, he, uh, he performed sexual magic, uh, and all of this um, in in that time frame was just considered to be absolute whoa, kind of like off, absolutely off the map, off the deep end. You know, he was members of secret organisations, occult organisations. He claimed he was the great beast 666. Um, so, and he performed, uh, you know, various rituals. Uh, we know that he sacrificed a goat in the Abbey of uh, Telema in, uh, in Sicily. Uh, there was a rumour of, a, of um, a cat being sacrificed and the blood being drunk, although that probably wasn't true. Uh, certainly not the blood being drunk. But you know, he got up to you know, pretty extreme things. He was into ex extremes, you know? Um, and he pushed his followers into those extreme ends as well. Even if you weren't comfortable with it, he would push you and push you and push you and push you. His, um, you know, he, his uh, magical uh, motto is, I will endure. So it gives you a sense of what this guy is. Essentially, Crowley's a, 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 I think Crowley is a bully. Um, but he, he bullies and pushes people and they end up burnt out and he's used them and he casts them aside and he keeps moving forward himself. He'd got um, devotees that were doing anything and everything that he wanted. Um, they believed that he was talking to, to, to spirits, possibly to aliens. Um, whether he really was, whether he really was, was this, this um, new messiah, or whether he was just a dirty old perv that was having it off with anyone and everyone that believed so much in him. Nobody really knows. What happened in Sicily? In Sicily, he establishes his, his, um, his religion and followers come out there and he forms what he hopes to be a spiritual college. Um, what it's more like is a commune in the 60s. So you've got a lot of free love, people having sex, taking a lot of drugs, which is absolutely scandalous. Uh, the British press get a hold of this and he's absolutely, you know, um, called the wickedest man in the world by the press uh, uh, while he's there. And eventually the goings on um, and the rumor and, the, and the, the rumor mill get so bad that Mussolini himself has had enough of, uh, of Mr. Crowley and, and attempts to get him kicked out and does eventually get him kicked out of Sheffield. Uh, in Sheffield, he was known by the people as, as a, a truly free man who lived, as, lived freely from out the restrictions of kind of religion. But rituals did go on in there. We know there was a sacrifice of a goat in a particular ritual. Uh, we know there was a lot of drug taking uh, and experimentation. There was a, a room in there called the Chamber of Nightmares. Uh, and these were these amazing psychedelic paintings of uh, people copulating with goats, um, a big degenerate god with a big phallus. Uh, and this was supposed to um, allow you to get rid of your um, pornographic fantasies. You, you, you would eventually become clear of all that sort of stuff and it, would, it wouldn't mean anything to you. You would get rid of all your Christian and your um, uh, baggage, as it were. And you, you, you'd be free from guilt. That was, that was the big thing about it. It is it, about being free, free from your own guilt. Crowley moved to Sicily and that's when things got really bad. That's when the sex and debauchery really, really started in earnest. Um, sacrifices, um, drinking of blood, um, sex with anybody. The man was trisexual, he'd try anything. Um, and he really was um, an evil, 
creature. There's no getting away from it. In fact, it, it got so bad that he he actually believed in vampires and and all of this sort of stuff. And he actually had his 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 fangs filed down and pointed so that when he was um, biting the necks of his of his of his lovers, mainly female but both, he actually referred to it as giving them a love bite. Aleister Crowley was definitely one of the most evil men in the world, and the legend speaks for itself, doesn't it? He participated in black masses and really questionable ritual practices with his whole Thelema religious group that he was involved in, uh, kicked out of England for his behavior and his, his involvement, and really got up to some really nasty deeds. This is where they would have blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, and although we can't prove it, we believe human sacrifices. Really morbid sort of stuff. And guess what? He was at the center of it. It was all about him. He sounds almost a bit ahead of his time, really. It's the sort of thing you'd imagine happening in the 60s, not in the 20s. Certainly, um, after Crowley's death in 1947, um, he, things go quiet. Um, the OTO, his big organisation, begins to splinter and break up a bit. Uh, but it's the 60s where it really, really picks up. The Beatles put Crowley on there on, on the uh, Sgt Pepper album. Um, uh, his books get reprinted again. Uh, people are finding them in second-hand bookshops, you know, for, for very little money. Now, now they're like currency now, you know. Um, and his whole philosophy begins to be taken on board by the 60s. Do what thou wilt. You know, do what you want. It, it, they took it to mean that. That's not actually what it means. It means find your true will, your reason for being here on this planet, and pursue it with a vengeance. That's, that's what he was saying. If you were to go on the internet and drag up the worst possible internet fetish sites you could find, Crowley probably did it. Now, you have to remember, he was one of the first. So he was always looking for something new, something interesting. Uh, there was a particularly famous one where he had did a particular magical ceremony which involved a woman having sex with a goat. Um, there was other ones where somebody died where they drank the blood of a cat that had been sacrificed. Um, so if you can think of it, he probably thought of it about 100 years ago. <laughs> How popular is Satanism today? Still very, very popular. Um, you've got the Church of Satan still going strong. You have the Church of Set, which is a splinter group of that. And then within the Church of Set, the, the Order of the Tra Trapezohedroid, which is a, a sort of H.P. Lovecraftian kind of feeling, uh, uh, a form of Satanism. A, a fairly sort of repugnant um, splinter of Satanism is the Order of Nine Angles. These guys have mixed Nazi uh, ideology within Satanism. Uh, and they're a very, very far-right group. Uh, you can get a lot of their stuff on the internet now about them and, and all their pamphlets and information are kind of published on the internet now, but quite um, uh, quite a nasty kind of form of Satanism to the point that neo-Nazis disowned um, the Order of Nine Angles and anybody associated with an occult, uh, neo-Satanic uh, Nazi group. At the very heart of Satanism are its rituals, the most infamous being the Black Mass. Its purpose was not only to worship the devil, but also to mock God, and may well involve animal sacrifices and blood, as well as blasphemy and obscenity. Its celebrants may well wear black robes and carry chalices and candles, and may often form a pentagram shape to carry out their ceremonies. It all is, as you can imagine, rather eerie. If I was to come across a, a, a satanic ritual or, or a black mass, what, what would I see? The altar is often a naked woman. Uh, the chalice is not filled with, with wine. It can be filled with uh, a mixture of, of um, uh, I believe, sperm and water. And then sometimes it, it's filled with bourbon, you know. Um, so there are elements of that still within Satanism. But Satanism has become much more sort of magical movement now. It's much more about spells, much more about sort of um, modern occultism uh, and less about um, uh, the old form of black mass, which was, you know, in complete uh, reversal of, of, um, of worship of, of God. A black mass is a ritual ceremony that uses magic for two purposes. One is the defamation of God and two, 
is the veneration of Satan. It's based on, on a Catholic mass, only it, it's a lot darker. Um, it, it's uh, people dressed in, in, in black robes with hoods, black candles, um, inverted um, crosses, blood sacrifices, the killing of goats and their blood drunk, um, all manner of, of, of debauchery and, and sex. And, and the, even the altar uh, is actually a naked woman. A live one, but a naked woman. I think the credibility of black masses is really questionable. If you think about the participants, why are these people participating in something like this? Um, is there something psychologically going on, on with them? And believing in the power of that is probably what produces the power or the, the energy surge for them of exerting their will in this, this form of evil to try to obtain what they want. So I think it's really about the psychological aspects of it. Does it really have magical powers? In my opinion, no. A satanic black mass is a magical ceremony and inversion or parody of the Catholic mass for the purpose of mocking God and worshipping the devil. According to reports, some have involved human sacrifice as well as obscenity and blasphemy of horrific proportions. Are we becoming more satanic as a society? I would say yes, we are. I think, I think we are. I think we're moving away. We like to indulge ourselves. People go to the gym, people uh, like to have sex, people like to take drugs, people like to do all these things that were you know, restricted, and we do them. People go out at weekends sometimes, they will take ecstasy and all the rest of it. Um, and that's considered normal now, you know. Certainly as Christianity's in decline, people are, are turning to alternative forms of religion. And obviously Satanism if there is such a thing as, as Satan, it's the alternative, it's something different. But to be honest with you, it gives a lot of people what they want. I don't think the church ever has. You know, when you look at it, let's be honest, the devil has a far better manifesto than the Ten Commandments. How difficult are they? This is the era of Fifty Shades of Grey. So going out, having a drink, getting drunk, cheating on your expense reports, having an affair, those are things that you could kind of justify and, you know, not be held accountable. So it's a whole different era when you think about it. It seems then, in this ever-changing world, the cult of Satan is as popular as ever, with more and more people meeting online or in person to worship or simply hang out. A few of them are pretty hardcore, but the majority consider their Satanism as a kind of protest vote against the church. They don't consider themselves particularly demonic, simply alternative. I'll see you next time. <laughs>